Um, it's my immense pleasure to welcome everyone this afternoon. And I see so many familiar places from outside PMML on the occasion of this public lecture, Interpreting the 1940s in India by Professor Indivar Kamtekar, who is currently a senior fellow with us. Uh, he is uh, one of the leading historians of modern India, as many of us are surely aware. He, is, uh, he teaches modern Indian history at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, he did his MA from JNU and a PhD from Cambridge in history. And he has been a faculty member of IIM Calcutta, a fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study at Shimla, visiting senior fellow at the National University of Singapore, ICCR professor at the Victoria University of Wellington and visiting professor at the universities of Gottington and Heidelberg. He specializes in the history of 20th century India. So I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Kamtekar. And we also have the pleasure of having with us our respected director, Sri Sanjeev Nandan Sahai, ex-Power Secretary who has very kindly consented to formally preside. So I extend a warm welcome to him also, sir. We are delighted to have you here. And as I said, I see so many uh, faces of uh, teachers, former teachers, friends, etc. I extend a very warm welcome to them. Uh, from the abstract that Professor Kamtekar has presented, it's very uh, clear that he is going to uh, sort of come up with a new framework about how to look at the 1940s in India. Generally, as he has said here, the 1940s in India have been seen from the prisms of uh, either India getting independence or partition happening and so on, but he is trying to present a new interpretation of the 1940s. So we all look forward to hearing him on this. Without further delay now, I would like to request Professor Kamtekar to proceed with his lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Ravi. Um, and thank you all for taking the trouble to come to hear these ideas. Uh, I've been fortunate to hear many of my colleagues as fellows in this institution speak on a variety of topics recently. And today, it's time for me to add my own research to our list. Uh, some friends who joined the services have also come here. Thank you for coming. I hope that you will add your experience-based perspectives uh, to the kinds of things which I'm going to say. Academic friends are also here who have objected to the kinds of things I say. I hope I shall have new arguments to meet your old objections. Uh, but I'm very glad to have the opportunity to present what I'm putting forward as a fresh historical framework. Now, as Ravi said, the 1940s, um, and as I said in the abstract to this talk, have usually been studied in terms of three frameworks. The transfer of power, this is framework one, by the British government. The achievement of independence by Indian nationalists, this is free, uh, framework two. And framework three, the partition of the territory into the new nation states of India and Pakistan. So there are three frameworks. What I'm trying in this lecture is to provide, to offer a fourth framework. And I'm making the claim that if you stretch this beyond the name of the, uh, the 1940s, then this fourth framework uh, allows us to see the whole of the 20th century in India, uh, to assemble parts of it, of Indian history, politics, economic planning, uh, public administration, under a single conceptual roof. Let me begin with a question which may sound a little provocative. Can history be too backward looking? Odd though this question may sound, I shall suggest that it can be asked quite legitimately about much of the historical writing we now have about 20th century India. The allegation can be made that 20th century Indian history looks backwards too much, but once the problem is diagnosed, a remedy can perhaps be prescribed. This remedy involves constructing a somewhat different story to make the edifice of Indian political history, so to say, double story, triple story, and so on and so forth. 
So far, the bricks from which Indian political history has mostly been built are extracts from politicians' speeches, reported in newspapers, their letters, culled from volumes of collected works, selected works, and the files of the colonial government, especially the Home Department. But there are other bricks or materials or source materials for political history which are readily available. These include autobiographies of officials and military officers, the annual reports of government departments, and the official publications like reports of commissions of inquiry and so on. What kind of building can these other bricks produce? Now, we all know this is a staple of history writing methodology that sources tend to structure a subject. The familiar edifying narratives of Indian independence come down to us, descend to us from, I would argue, political leaders, whether they're Indian, British, Pakistani. But politician speeches meant for public consumption have promoted one kind of history. If you're looking at official musings and reports, the internal lenses of the state, which are meant mainly for self-consumption, not for public consumption, they bring into focus a rather different view. After 1947, newly elevated Congress politicians looked down on the world from a much higher altitude than before, while governmental employees continued old careers. As a result, their viewing platform, which is lower but more stable, reveals a somewhat different landscape. Now, even from the perspective of officials, there was indeed a significant change, uh, as we'll see in the course of this. But the part of the change which I'm going to discuss was never, ever, it was never the stuff of newspaper headlines. Let's take a few minutes to sketch a portrait of the late colonial state. From Ram Mohan Roy onwards, several members of the Indian intelligentsia saw the colonial state as a kind of courier of modernity. By the 20th century, certainly by the 1930s, it was evident that only a small part of Indian society had received the promised package, the package of modernity. Five-sixths of the population still lived in the villages. Literacy was about 12%. And even allopathic medicine, there were in the 1930s, 40s, about 40,000 42,000 doctors, um, it was accessible to only about 10% of the Indian population. But though expectations of colonial rule declined, then gave way to nationalist anger against colonial rule, the idea of modernity in India remained to a great degree intertwined with the reach of the state apparatus. Many Indians became disillusioned with imperial rule but the state remained a repository of large hopes. So the sense was if the British kept, could not use the state properly, the Indian nationalists would do so. But there was a major obstacle. In 1933, a brash Indian undergraduate in Cambridge, VKRV Rao, the name may be familiar, read a paper at the student club, the political economy club, in the presence of, well, no less than John Maynard Keynes, the Economist, and the title of his uh, paper was Why I Would Decline to Accept the Finance Membership of Federal India. So this is the equivalent of an undergraduate reading in front of, well, our best economist, a paper saying, I don't want to be finance minister. What does Rao say when he recalls this? I quote, the main point I was then making was that finances available to the government of India from taxes were not sufficient to make any impact on the country's economic development. This is VKRV Rao in his memoirs. In due course, VKRV Rao's credentials became as impressive as his initials. VKRV, I suppose he said with pleasure. He was the first professor appointed by Delhi University in any subject. He founded the Delhi School of Economics. He was vice chancellor of Delhi University. He was a member of India's independent, uh, independent India's planning commission. He became minister of transport and shipping. He never got the finance ministership. So life is like that. His uh, undergraduate paper did not really work out. Uh, but he did become minister of education and a member of the union cabinet. 
the total revenues of the government of India, to which he referred so scornfully, were in the 1920s and 30s less than 10% of India's national income. So hearing this undergraduate paper, what did John Maynard Keynes, the great man, say? Keynes told the young economist not to be pessimistic, as you could always borrow money to finance development. This is what you'd expect. But Keynes's opinion was quite different from the practice of the government of India, which was fiscally conservative in the two decades before the Second World War, did its best to live within its means, to balance the budget, and it spent little on development. Now, if the money in the hands of the state is limited, then that restricts the number of the state's personnel. So how many people were there? In 1938, the government of India employed approximately one and a half million people. This is at a time when population of India is 350 million, 35 crores. So one and a half million is government employment. Who are these people? Among the departments of government, the largest employer was the railways. This is the case even later. Uh, railways at this time, late colonial government, had 625,000 men on its rolls. The army employed 2,20,000. If you add the Indian princely states forces, then there are about 3 lakhs is the size of the army. The police numbered 2 lakhs in the whole of India. Now, this police strength had remained static in the interwar period, while, as we know and we read in the books, society is rapidly politicized. So non-cooperation, civil disobedience, and so on, the British handled it with the same number of police. They don't expand the police uh, during the interwar period. This is a time the census tells us that India has about 500,000 villages. So the number of villages is two or three times the number of police constables. Number of police to police constables to uh, villages is about, well, one is to two or one is to three constables per village. There were twice as many policemen as postmen who numbered about one lakh in the whole of India. And of the rest of the one and a half million, some, there were about 350,000, three lakhs fifty in civilian administration, about half a lakh in central government, one and a half lakh, lakh clerks, uh, skilled personnel, and so on. Now, let's reflect on these figures. They give us a ratio of about one soldier to 1,000 of population. One soldier to 1,000 of population, while the ratio for policemen and postmen is much less than that. At the higher levels of state power, the numbers become more rarefied, smaller still. There is a lot of writing about the ICS, but the ICS is only about 1,000 strong as a service. Um, and it's a racial mix by the end, in, by the 1940s, about half-half, uh, Indian and British. Uh, the Indian police officers are about 800 in the whole country. Army has 3,000 officers. So later on, when we read the books or the library shelves in Teen Murti, there are many of these autobiographies. And they give the impression that the Indian Empire rests on the shoulders of the ICS and Indian police and so on and so forth. But actually, these people are few in number. They are more often spoken about than seen. So while you might have had a British Indian Empire without ICS, some commitment of British manpower had to be there. What are the numbers? In 1939, the secretary of the European group in the Indian Central Legislature said, my constituency is a small handful. At the outbreak of World War II, as I'll repeat, po Indian population 350 million, the number of adult white males in India was over 90,000. The total number of white men, women, and children was 160,000. The British were soldiers, non-officials, officials. The soldiers were the largest group, about 60,000. So the British were ruling India with a military presence of 60,000 from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, 60,000. That was it. The non-official class was about 20,000. These were businessmen in Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, Kanpur, or men in tea estates, coffee plantations, some people who were lawyers and journalists. The official class was 12,000 in all, in all the services. 
These included all the British members of the ICS, police, railways, irrigation, engineering services. So this most important group was numerically the smallest. On the basis of these figures, there were more than 2,000 Indians to each British person in India. 2,000 to 1 would be a kind of order of magnitude ratio. Uh, I'll put in something which is controversial now, though I don't want you to detract from the main argument, but there is a corollary to this, which is that although British rule in India was racist, racial interactions must have been very limited in number. One is to 2,000. So they must have been drowned for all except a few among the many oppressions and insults based on caste, class, and religion. South Africa had two million white people in a population of 12 million, so one is to six. Algeria, one in 10 people was a white settler. Here, racism could be a matter of everyday experience. In India, racism was indeed keenly felt and racial incidents were in recounted, for example, by those who traveled in first-class carriages in trains. But if we look at the railway reports, 97% of the Indians who traveled by train did so in third class. With a white population of 1,60,000 in all, for 350 million Indians, to have a widespread, direct experience of racism was a logical impossibility. Now, I'm saying direct experience. This is not to say that people don't feel strongly about things which they don't have a direct experience. But logically, direct experience of racism was not possible if you had a ratio of 1 is to 2,000. Encounters with colonial state power usually meant, in practice, encounters with other Indians. So what is the extent of contact between colonial state and Indian society? What are the interfaces? After the Government of India Act of 1935 came into force, the number of voters in India was 35 million, one in 10 of population. Now, this is more significant than it might appear because of the um, 350 million, many would have been children and so on. It actually meant that about, at the end of British rule, a quarter of the adult male population had the vote. But then voting is a rare affair. You go to the booth only once in a while. Another interface. At this time, the banking sector wasn't developed, so post office savings bank was where people put their money. There were about 4.2 million post office bank accounts. That gives us a ratio of 1 is to 100 of population. Railway statistics tell us that in 1938, there were 530 railway journeys. So this is less than two, pe two per person per year. Uh, much of the country was beyond the reach of railways and roads. Some of it was beyond the postal service. There were about, this is from the postal, uh, Post and Telegraph Department reports, there were 50,000 so-called no dark, this is the official terminology, villages, which the reports of the PNT department themselves say are beyond the reach of the postal service. So no letter ever reaches. In the rest of India, the number of postal items delivered, which is more or less stable in the 1930s, is 1.2 billion, so about three items of post of all kinds per year. Contact with other arms of the state is even weaker, more tenuous. The jail, now this is particularly important, the, the jails, all the jails of British India had a capacity of 1,22,000. 1 1,22,000 prisoners in all. If you think about it, and you're thinking about the Gandhian or nationalist mobilizations, if they could get 122,000 young men to go to jail, which is a very, very small population in percentage out of 350 million population, the jails would be full. So how does one then think about, this is the point I'm making in a way, is that this is a much less politicized society. If Gandhiji could get even a small, per, very small perception, percentage of young men to go to jail, the British jails would have been full. So we need to think about that. 1,22,000 in a population of 350 million. The number of radio licenses was 93,000 at the end of 1939. The Controller General of AIR, All India Radio, said the radio program, I'm quoting him, was the biggest flop of all times. Income tax, the number of income taxpayers was about 3 lakhs, which meant 1 in 1,000 people pay tax in India. Now, what does all this mean? 
the colonial state has loomed la very large in the eyes of historians. But that's probably because the social location of historians has made them stand too close to it. So when you stand very close to something, it looks larger. And since many historians are, are uh, possible government recruits, it looks very large. But for most of the people of India, the colonial state is a much more remote presence than those who are, let's say, civil service aspirants. So for perspective, I'm suggesting we take a few steps back. Uh, and for most of the people of India, the presence of the state is much more remote. This then about how small is the colonial state. With the Second World War, this actually changes dramatically. World War II reduces, suddenly and unexpectedly, the distance between the colonial state and Indian society. It's as if various areas of Indian life which have been fenced off and protected suddenly face a new onrush or onslaught of state power. Um, the new war priority of the colonial state overrides previous concerns. When he's appointed viceroy in 1943, Lord Wavell gets a directive from the British War Cabinet, which begins by telling him, your first duty is the defense of India from Japanese uh, menace and invasion. So once World War II is on, the Japanese are threatening India, everything else matters less. And we have to say this, that the Japanese frighten the British much more than the Congress Party or Indian nationalism ever can. Because uh, there are cases, for example, when the Japanese uh, come to Northeast, that they actually behead an officer of the ICS. So it's a much more serious threat than uh, comes from the social movement. Every level of government is uh, affected and the state is convulsed by Japanese threat to a greater degree than by Indian nationalism. There are new jobs for everybody in government, collect contributions for war funds, track deserters, help refugees, organize air raid precautions, supervise rationing, uh, procure food, gra food grains. These are jobs which old administration of colonial power uh, does not really know. In fact, one person says work as a magistrate had to be almost completely abandoned in favor of new burdens. He said, touring has to be cut down to a series of lightning forays, often to track down and requisition stores of hoarded rice. There is a recruitment of over 2 million Indians into the Indian Army. Again, it's interesting if you contrast. Jails can take 1,22,000, but the colonial army takes 2 million as employment. Uh, this is the new employment generated by the World War. And of course, the uh, Army requires and receives supplies of foods, guns, ammunitions, uniforms, uh, everything which an army needs. Steel is made by the Tata Steel Works. India doesn't become a battlefield, only the Northeast does, but it's an active center of operations as a supply base. It's a very major supply base. The pre-war colonial state, that slender state which I sketched, can't do this. It lacks the capability to lift up the enormous economic burden of a world war. Let it be said that in the 20th century, the big war is the Second World War. When you're talking about the Pakistan or China wars, these are matters of weeks or days. World War II is six years it is going on. Now, how is the war then financed? A lot of money is needed. Uh, this requires the state to change rapidly actually beyond recognition. It can be said that for many of us, our financial habits are a basic character trait. They are reflective of something deeper, not easily altered in adult life, requiring a major event to change them. Now, the, for the colonial state, the emergency of war changed its fiscal habits. War leads, with imp for, with, uh, leads to impatience with auditors. Massive amounts of money had to be raised, Balancing the budget was forgotten. Deficit finance was undertaken. New government posts and departments <coughs> proliferated. New policies were announced. New legislations were promulgated. This is the time you started with a uh, controller of capital issues, the supply department, later we know as DGSND, uh, the policy of price control, foreign exchange control, control of imports and exports, all these issued under the DIR or Defense of India rules. And after the war was over, 
it, the instability continued. There was demobilization of soldiers, strikes by workers, communal riots, partition, refugee rehabilitation, integration of princely states. So the wartime measures continued. For example, foreign exchange control was first introduced in September 1939 as a kind of temporary measure. In March 1947, uh, this so-called temporary measure, measure uh, the, it took the form of FERA, Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, for another five years. After five years, extended for another five. 1957, it was made permanent. Permanent means till the Manmohan Singh reforms in the 1990s. Later, the issue of government economic controls was much debated in India. On one view, such controls enabled the Indian nation to take its first steps and later guided the economy towards maturity. By the end of the 20th century, the opposite view became fashionable. An economy capable of racing ahead of competitors was, it was argued, tripped by red tape. Praise was awarded or blame accorded to the idea of planning and the ideology of socialism. But what I'm trying to say is that history shows that controls, which in independent India we assume are conceived by socialist ideology, they are actually produced by the war economy. One Indian civil service officer put this point this way. I'm quoting. This is Bhutalingam of the ICS. He said, many observers of the Indian scene are apt to take it for granted that the system of economic controls is the result of the avowed and oft-repeated aim of the government of India to create a socialistic pattern of society by means of national planning. This is not really so. It is just not historically true. Practically, the entire paraphernalia of controls was already in existence before the age of planning was ushered in 1951. Economic controls in India do not, therefore, owe their origin to planning, nor have they continued and developed merely because of planning." Unquote. So the point is that economic controls were happily adopted by Indian planning, but were not, so to say, its biological offspring. And the war e or economy also fathered other children who grew up to have lives of their own, uh, very high rates of taxation, for example, sales tax as a major source of revenue, very widespread tax evasion, and also a bureaucratic mindset, very much there in post-independence India, that businessmen should do as they are told. Told by whom? Told by bureaucrats. Adding to his memoirs an appendix titled The Long Shadow of the Second World War, the economist I.G. Patel summarized his assessment as follows. Now, uh, I.G. Patel was later on governor of RBI and uh, director of London School of Economics, among many other positions. What does I.G. Patel write? He says, in, quote, in short, the post-war preference for price stability versus growth, management and planning versus free markets, closed economy versus freer international trade, public sector as against private enterprise, and the on-again, off-again flirtation with controls and high taxes all had some roots in our wartime experience." Unquote. So the World War ended, but the controls and mindsets engendered remained. They encouraged living with shortages rather than overcoming them. They damaged the ideology and practice of the market, and the, they opened the door to what we know as the license permit Raj, or license permit quota Raj. The effects of the war on the state were profound and prolonged. So what I've done is to sketch or to try to make the case for the wartime paternity of the license permit Raj. And now we look at one or two of the sub areas in this. So I'll take up two. This, the, there are uh, multidimensional uh, changes in the state, but for paucity of time, we can take up only one or two. One is the control of food. It's during the 1940s that the state in India took up this huge responsibility of feeding people, which it couldn't either discard properly or fulfill properly in subsequent decades. When they started off doing this, no one saw where this path would lead. 
It began with officials, local government officials in districts, intervening in the grain market in an uncoordinated way, even at government to fix prices. None of this, I stress, followed from any theory. One of the governors of one of the provinces, he said, uh, he said, this is the governor of Bihar, he said, by conviction, I hold with Adam Smith, but in a crisis like this, I am prepared to accept 100% control. And then came the Bengal famine, in which perhaps two or three million people died. Apart from the human cost, the army, uh, the military implications of famine worried the state, that there might be riots um, due to famine, munitions production would stop. So uh, the government intervened very, very uh, strongly to try to control the food situation. There was a Food Grains Policy Commission uh, committee which recommended rationing price controls over not just food grains but sugar, edible oils and other commodities. In other words, the degree of government control over the economy changed remarkably. And I stress again, this is not with great intention. The colonial state wished to interfere as little as possible to stick to a kind of laissez-faire policy in many areas but the crisis caused by military demands and expenditure prevented it from doing so and overturned its policy. The rationing apparatus of the government of India, which metamorphoses into what we know as PDS, uh, prevented the government from behaving as it would have wanted to. It overturned its policy. It's an outcome of World War II. Uh, in fact, Gorwala, an ICS officer in the Bombay presidency, he said, this is so strange, earlier we did uh, uh, law and order, and then he says, I quote, one of the largest businesses in the country, he's talking about food grains, uh, with an enormous turnover was being run by a government department. This is a huge change for a service like the ICS, which is concerned before that with the maintenance of law and order and the collection of revenue. How big is the change? Well, the numbers tell part of the story. If you're looking at the number of people dependent on government rations, rationing which would, would have about 3 lakh to 4 lakh people dependent at the end of 1942. But it, incre it increases to uh, 40 million or so by the end of 1944, uh, 130 million in April 1946, and by the end of 1947, so this continues, um, there are about 160 million people who are actually being rationed by the government. So this is about 30% of the population. So you, earlier you have police force, one constable to two or three villages. Now 30% of the Indian population is receiving some kind of commodity from the government. And as far as food is concerned, the state has for the first time in its history directly committed itself to feeding a large section of the population. I, I have given various statistics earlier, and, uh, but there is a qualitative change also going on. Because uh, when you have rationing, it means that state and people meet more often. And it means that the nature of contact between state and society is also altered. A police thana is almost always a place for a person to avoid. A ration shop is a place to go to without fear and to go to regularly. This new interventionist role of the state was challenged after independence. Some politicians had misgivings, uh, Gandhi in particular. Uh, Gandhiji said that controls should go because they are leading to corruption. Uh, and he was disgusted by the corruption. Rajendra Prasad, who was food minister, he put up a formal proposal that you withdraw food control. The result of this was a disaster. The prices rose, and they had to reimpose. So what we see is that controls are established haphazardly in the war. And despite some interludes without rationing, the procurement and distribution of food remains for decades one of the main tasks of the government of India. Now something else follows from this. If you are rationing such a large proportion of the population, you need people to do it. So the greater range of activities requires a greater number of personnel. And the result is an inflation in the size of the colonial state to a degree never seen before under colonial rule. One way of studying the growth of the central government's civilian apparatus 
and its new extravagance in the 1940s is by reading the report published in 1949 of the Government of India's Economy Committee. Now, at the end of World War II, there is so much expenditure that government has, uh, creates an economy committee. Its report is limited to central government, not provincial governments and military forces. Uh, it doesn't lead to any economy, but what it does is to generate a lot of statistics which we can uh, learn something about the state from. What does this economy committee report say? It says that during the war, the number of secretaries to government has more than doubled. The number of uh, undersecretaries has multiplied 10 times. So one undersecretary before the war, 10 undersecretaries after the war. Within the number of clerks and stenographers has multiplied four times. The total number of ministries has increased from 8 to 18. And government ranks contain, the economy committee says, too many recruits. By the standards of today, the numbers are small. By earlier standards, they seem very large. The report of the Economy Committee can make amusing reading. Its prescriptions read like a list of things that did not happen. But they give us, as I said, interesting statistics. They say Delhi is too congested, so this is 1949. Government ministries should move. Uh, public sector undertakings are growing too fast. They should be curbed. Number of ministries should decrease. One of the recommendations of the economy committee is that education ministry is unnecessary. Hmm? Uh, so they say abolish it. The other thing they say is useless ranks and categories, like additional secretary and joint secretary have been created in the war. These have no justification and they should be abolished. Government of India has too many cars. Now to the <laughs> A resident of independent India, a government without public sector, without joint secretaries, additional secretaries, seems as incredible as time travel. In fact, some who have been joint secretaries are present among us, as we know. So we cannot imagine the government of India without them. But this was the recommendation. Uh, if the report of the Economy Committee had been taken seriously, much of the post-independence Indian state would not exist. But we know only too well that the Joint Secretary did not follow the dodo into extinction. Many of the species are still salamed in the Central Secretariat and other ministries. An attempt to measure the size of the Indian state was made in 1957 in a lecture by H.M. Patel at the Indian Institute of Public Administration. H.M. Patel was cabinet secretary. He was also so ICS officer, cabinet secretary. Later on, he was minister for finance and home minister in the Moraji cabinet. Um, he looked at the, so he should know about the size of the government. He looked first at the payroll of the central government. He used the census of the central statistical organization. And he said, there is a three to four fold growth in employment during the 1940s. And there are detailed calculations which he made. Uh, roughly, he said that one in 20 people in India of the working population are employed by government. This is much less, incidentally, than in uh, the UK at the time, uh, where also he does his calculations. But uh, one in 20 people at work, according to him, was this. And this is after the unprecedented growth of state power. What we've seen is that the causes of growth of state power uh, were also different from elsewhere. In Western societies, the welfare state had been the main multiplier of government employment. In India, it is the war which multiplies employment. Again, there is a reflection on this. That Indian history writing, we hear often about the giving up of government jobs as an act of protest or non-cooperation. So and so got into the ICS but did not take the job, miraculously. And But what I'm saying is that while the colonial state is often portrayed as evil, to the people of India, it is often then a reliable and much desired employer. Uh, and for quite a few of them, events after 1947 uh, assured many temporary government employees that they became permanent. So inflated by the needs of war, the state apparatus in India maintained its larger shape, then expanded further. Meanwhile, the vocabulary of the state changed from the rhetoric of war 
to the tasks of independent nation building. But what happened to many government employees, for them what mattered most was not they that they changed their bosses or job descriptions, but that the salary came in on a regular basis. The last area, so I'm not taking up education and all kinds of other aspects. As many as we know, uh, there are many things which happen. The, uh, the, the revenue person in a village becomes often a state employee and so on and so forth. And many of us get jobs in government universities. So they, it's a multidimensional process. I'm going to look for a little time at the police force. What does freedom mean for the coercive power of the Indian state? And the argument here is that there is a more muscular police force. Developments within the state become clearer when we look at one of its arms, the police force. The standard histories of the Indian police, whether it is Percival Griffiths to guard my people, Anand Swarup Gupta, police in British India, so on and so forth, uh, they end in 1947. One work which does look beyond that year is by S.K. Jha. It is a detailed study of police in Bihar. And he calls the chapter on developments after 1947, very strange title. It is Renaissance. Now, this may seem a peculiar, Renaissance may seem a peculiar word to describe the condition of a colonially recruited police force when political freedom has just been attained. So why is this word Renaissance used? And there is a story here, which I would put it to you, one of the sources is a rather dry publication it comes out of the statistical abstract of India annual. What does freedom mean for the police? Supplying statistics of the police force, the volume of the statistical abstract for 1951-52, published 1953, reveals that between 1946 and 1949, the number of police officers in India multiplies four times. The number of policemen doubles, the number of rifles at their disposal increases 400%. So very roughly, just to get this again, about 45 to 50. Number of policemen in India is doubling. Number of rifles is increasing, increasing by a factor of four. I'm putting it to you that this is, you can interpret this in various ways, but this is a fact to put on the table of or in the gallery of important facts of Indian history. This fact that free India, independent India, is a much more heavily policed India. Nobody says this. But there is no doubt about it. It comes out of multiple sources. You can interpret it in different ways, but it is a fact that the coercive ability of the Indian state, in, of the in, what is called the infant Indian state, is much greater than that of the colonial state. And again, I'm saying there is a twist to this, because people talk about the newborn babe of the Indian state, so fragile. I'm saying not at all the case. It has doubled the number of policemen, four times the number of rifles. We should recognize that a state intending to double its police force very quickly would normally face a problem. Recruits would have to be swiftly identified and rapidly trained. Retaining levels of discipline might not be easy. But, but. After 1945, employing many more suitable policemen was easier. When the war ended, Indian soldiers had to be demobilized. Wavell, the wartime viceroy, had dreaded the unrest this might create. But what might have been a problem for the stability of the state became, as it turned out, a part of the solution. Here was a vast amount of unemployed manpower, trained in violence, supposedly trained in discipline. Not surprisingly, ex-servicemen were preferred in police employment. Units of the armed police seemed a natural new habitat for them. Battle-hardened troops from the Rajput regiments, for example, were inducted into the forces in UP. The person in charge of the home department of the government of UP, uh, United Provinces, uh, Rajeshwar Dayal, later described how all that had to be done, he writes in his autobiography, was to replace their military badges with police badges. The increase in police strength was directly linked to the end of the Second World War. Not just in strength, in strength in numbers, but in training and in equipment. The police received at least some portion of the wartime armory. The special armed police got automatic weapons. 
Before the war, constables had pedaled along on bicycles. Now motor transport came in a big way. Old army jeeps became available for police work. Radio sets were available. These went into the police radio network. Compared to the pre-war period, by the end of the 1940s, the Indian police had many more men with a military background and training, armed with guns rather than lathis, using wireless sets to communicate with each other, and traveling by motorized transport. Surplus equipment was often inherited by the police. An example of this process is provided by the raising of the Provincial Armed Constabulary, which we know as PAC, in UP. B. N. Lahiri, the police officer in charge of the process, wrote in his autobiography that the PAC began with units drawn from the army. Partition had created huge social disturbances, more were feared. Lahiri recalled, he says, he went, he says, I went to the area military commander in Lucknow asking for help in recruitment. Though the commander, Major General Curtis, was initially skeptical, his attitude changed completely when he realized that the pro police proposal would give re-employment to several thousand of his men. He became most helpful. At the same time, routine government procedures were short-circuited. So B.N. Lahiri, who did this recruitment, uh, Indian police officer, he writes, I quote, it took less than 72 hours for the entire scheme of reorganization of the PAC, costing approximately a crore and a half to get through the finance department. Moreover, mythical as it may seem today, I was given a free hand in the enlistment of all its personnel from the commandant of a battalion down to its smallest officer without any questions being asked. Quick expansion of this force had another angle to it as well. The police force of the UP had a high number of Muslims. Muslims were 80% at the rank of inspector, 50% at sub-inspector, 33% among the constabulary. It was said that the person who took down the FIR at police stations was almost invariably a Muslim. Recruiting new policemen would change this. One of the controllers, Lahiri writes later, I'm quoting again. An unspoken advantage was that at the two military demobilization centers, the Jawans were almost entirely Hindu. So without breaching the general principle of maintaining an equal field for all communities, in the matter of recruitment, a corrective step to reduce the imbalance could be taken." Unquote. He also writes that Home Minister Sardar Patel flew to Lucknow, sent for him, and again I'm quoting, he seemed particularly concerned about the communal composition of the police force. Fortunately, I was able to inform him about the PAC, which was then in the process of formation and would incidentally take care of any communal inequalities within the force. He expressed approval of the proposed arrangements and did not ask for any additional measures." Unquote. Another thing which we see, and this is fast forwarding, uh, just to give, I'm making this long shadow of World War II uh, on the way our state is structured, trying to make it clear. Uh, and this may surprise you, that the wartime armory from World War II is used even in Punjab in the late 1980s, so many years after that, in the government of India's battle against the Khalistan movement. KPS Gill, the police officer whom we know, uh, was involved in handling the Khalistan movement, what does he write? I'm quoting KPS Gill. With counter-terrorist operations under my charge, I pressed urgently for an upgradation of weaponry. A large number of light machine guns, LMGs, acquired in the pre-independence era were lying unused in their original packing in the armories of various police stations all over the state. After strong personal insistence on my part, and against the prevailing wisdom of those in authority, these weapons were eventually brought out and mounted on key police stations, as well as, an, as on escort vehicles of station house officers, SHOs, and other frontline police officers." Unquote. So it's going on World War II armory is being used in the 1980s. Uh, KPS Gill does say, however, that by this time, World War II equipment is no longer ac accurate. And he goes on to write that the LMGs, however, were too clumsy and heavy. They were hardly a suitable counter 
to the AK-47s being used by the Khalistans. Let me draw the threads of this argument together uh, and try to reach a kind of conclusion which brings this framework out. History wears many masks. From a geographical viewpoint, India shrank in the 1940s when the 1947 partition reduced its population and divided its territory. Viewed from the Western world, the contraction of the British Empire obscured the expansion of the Indian state. Within India, freedom was foregrounded. The end of British power masked the growth of state power. The story I've told today was thereby submerged, drowned in slogans and celebrations. But where masks are worn, history writing has a compulsion to look behind them. I began by asking whether history can be too backward looking. So I'm concluding by asserting that the history of 20th century India is indeed too backward looking because it concentrates on the decline of British power rather than on the growth of state power. Looking at the 1940s in particular, the argument is that the study of these years, conventionally centered on imperial retreat and nationalist triumph, may benefit from a different focus. Never before was there such an impingement of state on society. The 1940s in India can be seen, can be analyzed as years of state expansion. So in two words, that is the alternative perspective which you can then stretch into the 20th century. This state expansion took place in the scope of government activity, manpower, financial resources, equipment, and ambition. So as I said, three frameworks, decolonization, transfer of power, second framework, independence, freedom movement, third, partition, creation of Pakistan, fourth framework which I offer, is expansion of state power in India, uh, which obviously can be nuanced, where did it happen, where did it not happen, and so on, but state expansion. Such analysis speaks to the issue of state formation in India. It emphasizes a metamorphosis which began before British rule passed away. Measures conceived in an imperial emergency were continued and developed in the nation state's interest in more tranquil times. Many of the colonial states' economic practices in wartime became the independent nation states' economic policies in peacetime. Many of the persons hastily employed under the emergency recruitment schemes of the 1940s, people like P. N. Haksar, people like P. K. Dave, who became governor of Lieutenant LG of Delhi, went on much later to hold high office in independent India. Some untypical aspects of the colonial state became typical of the post-colonial state. Ironically, some of these late imperial initiatives continued under the ideological ages of socialism. So strangely, as things turned out, an imperial war effort molded the shape of an independent state. In general, modern Indian history has not given much weight to war. In particular, standard works on post-1947 India whether it is Maurice Jones' Government and Politics of India many years ago, uh, Paul Brass's Politics of India, Bipin Chandra's India after independence, the textbooks, have overlooked or neglected the contribution of World War II to molding the shape of the emerging state. Yet precisely here, within the state expansion of the war and post-war years, are to be found some of the foundations of the new government of India. Looked at in this way, Within a process of state expansion, the location of the 1940s within Indian history is changed. In the historical record, the passage of time changes the punctuation. Once a full stop, the year 1947 now looks more like a semicolon, perhaps a comma. The 20th century in India now seems the stage not of a concluded contest, but of a continuing process. Hitherto labeled as the concluding chapter of British rule, the 1940s can be seen as an earlier chapter in the growth of state power. In this perhaps more forward-looking perspective, the 1940s point towards the activities of the Planning Commission, the proliferation of paramilitary forces, 
the mushrooming public sector enterprises, and the massive rationing apparatus which grew in modern India. By the close of the 20th century, an attempt had been made to make a voter's identity card compulsory for each adult individual. Aadhaar was still some distance away. But that attempt, as we know from the voter's I card, had faltered, and many Indian citizens remained unidentified by our government. The most common document by which the Indian state bestowed rights on a citizen was throughout the second half of the 20th century in India, not birth certificate, income tax number, driving license, passport, or voter I card, but the booklet known as the ration card. It could be quite a struggle to get one, and many Indians, especially among the poor who needed it most, did not have one. Nevertheless, for the individual in 20th century, late 20th century India, the ration card was the most common official proof of existence. The ration card was also, in a sense, an emblem of state expansion. It brings us face to face with a paradox with which I wish to conclude. The paradox that state power increased even as colonialism declined. More than the lime-washed World War II barracks around India Gate, which housed various government offices, which we have been to over the years, uh, more than the police jeep and wireless, I would hope that it is the ration card which can serve as the symbol of today's story. If the government of India becomes a truly welfare state, then that card and the state expansion of the 1940s will be a part of its history. Uh, may I now request uh, our director, Sri Sanjeev Nandan Sahayji, for his presidential uh, remarks. Thank you, uh, thank you <coughs> Professor Kamteka. Brilliant talk, very incisive, and the fact that you got through to the audience is evident from the whole long list of questions that and discussions we have had. I, in particular, enjoyed your uh, talk immensely, and it's a very different framework. The fourth framework, as you called it? That's what I'm floating it as now. <laughs> so. Okay. So, well, what, whatever the state of fourth state be, I hope the fourth framework is free to progress further. But, you know, things remain the same. Some nuggets of information about decongestion of Delhi. Till 20, 2005, 2010, the discussion has been going on, I didn't know, 80, 70 years later, 80 years later, about decongestion of Delhi. I remember when I was in the Prime Minister's office, the then Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, writes very persuasively to the Home Minister, Govind Pallapant, to reduce the number of peons in the offices. And he's very troubled by the number of peons who sit outside people's offices and the numbers as he writes, numbers have increased as per hierarchy. So unfortunately, ministers' offices have the maximum numbers of peons sitting outside. This question has not yet been resolved. He <laughs> 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 just called them FTS. So well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this absolutely different, fresh way of looking at evidence and uh, this framework, which naturally, because it's a new framework, uh, you've had a lot of reaction to it. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me take this opportunity to thank all members of this distinguished audience. And uh, as I said, there are many uh, teachers, others, seniors, etc. here. So I thank them all for coming here this afternoon and for enthusiastically participating in uh, what certainly promises to be a fourth uh, well-accepted framework, questions apart, of course, debates will continue. But certainly, it is a brilliant exposition uh, on the 1940s in India, a new way of looking <coughs> at uh, the expansion of the state then and, and its consequences after independence in India. So I once again thank uh, Professor Indivar Kamtekar, who has been with us now for more than a year as a senior fellow, for uh, accepting the invitation and delivering this uh, brilliant lecture. And of course, the discussion is not ending here. 
as in the old tradition of uh, social sciences, the discussion will continue over tea. So I invite everybody to join us for a cup of tea. Thank you for coming for the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks.